Okay. Good morning, everyone. All right. So uh, in today's class, uh, by just doing a quick review of what we did last week, anyone would like to share what we did last week? What did we do? That is last week's. This week, you tell me what you did. How Paul reached out to Athens. Okay. What was what is it? What is the main thing that we took from that sessions? Okay, understand their culture. What else? Understand their beliefs. Observe how they do their daily life. Okay. Yes, what else? Okay, using their own uh, what is belief system to bring about a, a way to you know reach out. Who else? Only two of them are saying something. What about you guys? What did you understand from last class? It's very important that not only for evangelism, but also to understand the whole scripture of whole passage from Acts chapter 17 uh, and how the encounter of the gospel happened there. What else did you learn? If only this was not recording. OK, anyways, guys, Nina John says, recognize where people are in their spiritual quest. Surya says, culture and their and their own traditional lifestyle, yes. Uh, understanding from there, thank you. OK, I'm going to move on. We're going to go to chapter 9, and we'll talk about witness and demonstrate. OK, uh, yes, we've been talking about witnessing. We're talking about demonstrating. Now, the Lord Jesus has commissioned us to witness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now. In the early chapters, we looked at why is the Holy Spirit important, right? Acts, in Acts chapter 1, he says, I will fill you with power to be a witness, right? So we also looked at how you know Jesus blew on the disciples, the Holy Spirit, but he also told them, go and wait, because you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I, the Holy Spirit is in us, and it says here, the Lord Jesus has commissioned us to be witnesses through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So what is important? How do we be a witness? How can we, you and I, be a witness? The answer, the answer is just there. How do we be a witness? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, when the Holy Spirit demonstrates itself, what are the, you have Holy Spirit happening this year? Right. Tell me two or three things. What is the characteristic of a Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit? Two, three things. Characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Sorry? He cleanses us, okay. He helps us, edifies us. God's love is poured out in our hearts. Huh? Guidance, okay. So th these are things that he does for us. But what are his characteristics? What is what? What is the Holy Spirit? Who is he? Is he a? You're studying it, right? Tell me. Hmm? He's a person. Okay. What is the characteristic of the Holy Spirit? Okay, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the characteristic? Ah, thank you so much, Prabhu. He's holy. Okay, what is next? Holy Spirit is holy. Thank you. What else? 
Come on, see the online students are so nicely answering. Hmm? Okay, he's omni he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, okay. <laughs> he's God. Okay, I'll tell you. He's powerful. Yes or no? There is Holy Spirit is powerful or no? Huh? Witness the Holy Spirit through your life testimony. Now, we need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit enables us to do things we can't do in our own strength. Right? On our own ability, we can do many things. But many a times, what we do in our own ability is not going to bear fruit. Or even if it bears fruit, it, it won't be long-lasting fruit. Something that is born of the Spirit will always bear fruit. Yes? Right? So Jesus has commissioned us to be witnesses in two ways. One, in our life testimony. Right? How we live. And two, how we speak and how we portray ourselves. Right? What we say. Now, it's easy to be a testimony on Sunday in church. Yes? What about Monday to Friday? How can we be a testimony? Now, it says there, the Holy Spirit will witness through us to be a testimony. So when people look at us, we are to be portraying or displaying what Jesus wants us to be. Now, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. This is very interesting. A church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. They're prophesying. There's word of knowledge. There is uh, gifts of healing. There's working of miracles. All that is there. But Paul is saying one simple thing. You don't have love. And what is love? It's a characteristic of the... God is love. Now... So Paul is saying, all this you're doing is good, right? But your lifestyle is not showing the same thing. So he's, he's talking to the Corinthians. He's saying, demonstrate what you're doing, right? You can prophesy, word of knowledge, everything is very good. But if we don't have love, or we're not demonstrating it in our life, it's of no use, right? So we demonstrate the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. How do we live? How do we speak? How do we say and communicate with people? That is very important. Right? Imagine, you know, you're, you're, I think I've used this example, right? You're, uh, I was going on the, you know, you know, I was going someplace and there was this car which had the sticker, Jesus loves you. Did I say this example? Right? Yes, I have. I don't know if it was an auto or what, but this sticker had Jesus loves you. But this man from the car came out, there was some small accident. He came out and he started abusing the other person, full of bad words and, you know. But that didn't show. There's no use of putting sticker, Jesus loves you. Anybody can put a sticker. Jesus asks us, he's filled us with the Holy Spirit to demonstrate it in our life. That's where it matters, right? Your life testimony and what you say. And each one of us can be a testimony. You know, you're going to go back to your hometowns or people will notice your life. People will notice, even in church, people will notice, right? Why? Because you're, you're planning, you're trying to be a testimony. People will notice it. Many times when I was working in the IT uh, company before joining, there were many times there were opportunities to you know change things in the reports that we make, right? Increase the sales numbers or do something to you know uh, just cheat in that whole process. But being true to yourself is a life testimony. Many a times, my own. Managers have asked me, why don't you put this number? It's okay. Nobody will know. I said, no. I've done badly. You've done badly. If I've done good, you've done good. 
but those became opportunities to minister the gospel right so i remember there was a time when i was in in id comp in, in when i was working in the id company people knew that this fellow won't cheat no he, he will not no need to ask paul or no need, there was another person also no need to ask these two they will not do anything they will not go against the rules of this company they knew it now that is a life testimony and our life testimony counts god is calling us to be witnesses through our life testimony to to demonstrate through power and love demonstrate the gospel through the power of the holy spirit and through the love of god right so how how do we minister to people we've talked about this before first to the power of the holy spirit let the holy spirit work in and through you right so how does that count i got to spend time in prayer right i got to be spending time in god's word asking the holy spirit to minister to me god you speak to me speak to me in words of knowledge speak to me in a prophetic word minister to me empower me so the more we are empowered the more we will be able to release the things of god to others remember this the holy spirit usually takes what is inside and he releases it if i don't read the word of god and i'm ministering to people most often i won't be able to give bible verses to minister to them why because i'm not taken in for the holy spirit to take and give out you get what i'm saying right there are times when the holy spirit can just give us a verse and we don't even know about it a chapter and a verse but most often he uses what we already have to minister to people right so how do we witness through uh, your life testimony let's read matthew chapter 5 13 through 16 Matthew five thirteen through sixteen. Yes, go ahead. let your light shine so much through men that people may see your life and glorify the father in heaven right and so jesus is so powerfully putting it across if if the salt loses its saltiness it is of no use but to be taken and thrown away right and if you are the light of the world nobody takes a light and puts it under a table but you put it on top so that that light spreads everywhere now picture yourself and picture myself like all of us god is saying you are the salt you are the light imagine you have a full box of salt right you're cooking you got a full box but the salt is used lost at saltiness will it add flavor to the food is it still called salt it's called salt but it's of no use so many times as christians we may be called christians But we're not living a Christian life. Well, he is a Christian. He has a Christian name, but not living as a Christian. So that's what Jesus is trying to say. We have salt, but if it loses its saltiness, it's of no use, right? Our life has to reflect who Jesus is, and let people see Jesus through our life. Now, is this easy or is this difficult? Is this easy or difficult? sorry yeah why are you so confused is this easy or difficult our, our life should reflect who jesus is but is it easy it's not easy right things are challenges are going to come obstacles are going to come the devil is going to come and cause confusion he's going to bring his attacks on us but we have the holy spirit with us and the spirit of god will enable us to be christ like on our own ability we will fail right philippians 2 14 and 15 read
Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Somebody else open to 1 Peter 2, 9, please. Yeah. So you can just open those verses. We quickly read Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Mm. Paul is saying, do all things with blamelessly, and when you do that, you will shine in front of the people that you are in. Right now, Paul is writing to a church in Philippi, which is filled with people who, you know, were involved in idol worship. They were involved in all kinds of uh, other activities. But he's saying, let your light shine in front of them. Do everything blamelessly, right? Now, for example, love your neighbors. Jesus said, no, love your neighbors. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said, love your neighbors? How many of you have stayed, uh, have fought with your neighbors? At least your parents would have. I, I always thought about it. Why neighbors? I mean, well, very difficult, right? What about uh, cheating? Lying, honoring your father and mother. What about strife, anger, jealousy? These are things that can draw us away from God. But Jesus is saying here, Paul is writing to the Philippian church. He says, let your light shine in such a way that they see and glorify the Father in heaven. Amen. What a wonderful opportunity this is for all of us to be a testimony. To witness through what you say. First Peter 2.9. Mm. But you read that first portion again, but yeah, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yeah, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Doesn't that, you know, really strike us? We are a chosen generation, a generation that will, that is called to live under God's will, under God's promises. A chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. It doesn't look like we are royal in any way, but we are. Right? What does Jesus say? This is a digression here. In the book of Revelation, he says, each one of us will be crowned with righteousness. Now, this is not a fake crown. It's going to be a real crown, crown of righteousness. Right? Rewards will be given to each one of us. Right? So, but know that the gospel that you share, uh, sorry, know the gospel so that you can share it in simply and clearly, in a simple way and clearly. Don't be ashamed of the gospel and the power of God in that gospel. Three, demonstrate. The power of God. Uh, let's read Mark 16, 17, and 18. Mark 16, 17, and 18. Right. So it's, what is the starting there? It says, and these signs will follow those who believe. So it is the whole thing of believing. And when we believe in God, believe in what the Lord Jesus did, those signs and wonders will follow. Right. So expect God to use you in power. Right. When you go back home for the semester break, don't go back and sit in the church in the back seat. Begin to minister with people, right? Begin to, ex of course, you can talk to your pastor and you know uh, ask them and 
ask and then do things, but then begin to minister. I always say this, you know, when I was in Bible college, I always gathered the boys around whoever had headache, leg pain and all that. Make them stand. Begin to exercise those gifts. They would eventually say, okay, I am healed. <laughs> right? But then what are we doing? We're exercising those gifts. Right? I love God to use you. Don't limit yourself. Never do that. Right? Never say, I can't do this. You can do. Right? I love God to use you. Use your authority and God will work through you. Use your authority. We are to use our authority. God has given it to us. We are to use it. Right? And then demonstrate the love of God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Yeah. So even as you minister to people, be compassionate, be loving, be kind to them. Right? Uh, God may be using us in different ways. But the key is to be compassionate. Remember, we spoke about how Jesus ministered out of compassion and love for people. He didn't do it because it was his job and he felt like I have to do it and then I have to be crucified. But he did what he did. He brought healing over people because he loved them. He had compassion on them. Right. So always remember, as you are ministering to people, let love and compassion be the basis of our ministry to people. Right. OK, let's go to the next chapter. We'll talk about praying for the unsaved. This is a very important, very, very important point and very important chapter on praying for the unsaved. Now, we know that the unsaved are it's a it's a spiritual battle, right? Nothing that we are doing when in terms of ministry is a natural battle. Everything about winning souls is a spiritual battle. Daniel says there are principalities and powers of darkness that are fighting against each other in the spiritual realms. Right? So God is at work and he is drawing people. But Satan also is at work and he's hindering people from being reached. So here we have God working. But here we have even Satan working. Right? Just because, you know, Satan is. Uh, or God is doing great things doesn't mean Satan is sitting back and doing nothing. No, he's also working, right? So how does Satan hinder people from receiving the gospel or receiving salvation, right? So let's read the couple of verses from there. First one, binding the minds of people, right? Now, sometimes in our mind, we think, you know, when we talk to people, we say, hey, how can there be a God? There is no God. Because it's a, it's a mind thing. They're thinking it naturally. Right? There can't be a God. How can God become man? Yeah. It's all here. So Satan binds them in their mind. Do you know people who have read the whole Bible, who know a lot of things from the Bible, but they still don't believe in Jesus? Why? Because their mind has been bound by the enemy. Right? Let's look at these couple of verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Yeah, who the God of this age has blinded, right? Next one, Matthew 4, 16. Yeah, Acts 26, 14 to 18. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we see uh, he's explaining here how God is, you know, the, the enemy has blinded people, blinded their minds, blinded their eyes. Revelations 12, 9, one of them can read. So the devil has blinded many people through deceptions. What is the word deception? Deception means lies. We know that uh, you know. There's, there's the, the Bible teaches us that Satan is a father of lies, right? So he has deceived or or deceptive people with lies. No, this can't be true. Right? You look at this. This is better. This is something that you can believe in. And this deception is not a small deception. It's a big deception. right? Many people are deceived with lies. Right? So the enemy is stopping them from believing in Jesus. right? Why? The God of this age has blinded them. So you and I, as believers, are to pray that this blindness is removed off. Now, can we go in the natural and say, Say anything to the other person from another faith? No. We can just say things. But the, the Holy Spirit, there's a spiritual battle that's happening. right? So we should be aware of that. He keeps them under a cloud of darkness. And these deceptions are hindrances to the light of the gospel. Sometimes these, these deceptions can be over groups of people or sometimes over individuals. right? But there are deceptions. Right, one of the greatest or biggest deception is how can Jesus die on the cross? How can God become man? It's a lie. Right? How can God become man? It's a lie. So what everyone are thinking, like people from other faith, it's a lie. Then how can Jesus die on the cross and rise again? It's a lie. Right? It's not truth. It's lies. Now, who is saying that? The devil. And who are the people who are believing? Those who have blinded their eyes. Their minds have been blinded. So they're not going to believe. Right? How can it be that Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day? He went up to heaven and then there's a place in heaven. And when we die, we will go to heaven. Where is this heaven? You see how the enemy works? His deceptions? It can be something very small. And it can grow and grow and grow and grow. And he can just take us from a place of believing to a place of complete unbelief. Have you ever wondered why people who are in ministry, people who are believers, all of a sudden they go to another faith or they want to do something else? They just reject the gospel. Why? Because the enemy, maybe they had one small doubt. right? And the enemy uses that. He pushes in lies. Yeah, this is not true. You think about it. Person died 20, 2000, more than 2,000 years ago. How can he be working now? doesn't make sense. It's a lie. But Satan himself knows it's the truth. But you see the deception he works in. He deceives us. He deceives people. Right? He holds them in bondage. The, those questions, how can it be? Why is it like this? These are all questions that can bind people, right? Then the devil works to hold people in bondage of different various other things, right? These could be strongholds, bondages, demonic bondages. There are people who are in, um, you know, uh, uh, in the occult practices, they are, or they're living in sin continuously, and there are people who you know, involved in sorcery and all kinds of idol worship. Now, all of this is only going to increase that blindness, right? Um, addictions, prostitution, corruption, trafficking, all kinds of things. Everything, every small evil deed the enemy can use over people. So now you look at this battle. It's not an easy battle. The enemy is defeated, right? There's a, there's a book that I was reading. It says, 
you know, God, the Lord Jesus trampled the serpent's head, right? But the tail only is doing so much of work. The head is crushed, but the tail is doing so much work. So the enemy is destroyed. He's defeated. But doesn't mean he's not working yet. Doesn't mean he's not powerful. He's still working. And that is why you, that's where you and I come in. Right? There are many, many testimonies I can share of you know, places that we went in North India where people were you know, possessed by demons. But just the word, the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, just that declaration of who he is. You know something? The devil knows whether you know Jesus or not. The devil knows whether you know Jesus or whether you know about Jesus. If you know about Jesus, he will play with you. He'll toss you around. Right? He will take you from one place and toss you around like a chessboard. But if you know about Jesus, he's not going to play with you. He, he, he knows, oh, this man, or this boy, this girl, he knows who's his savior. He knows Jesus. But if you know about Jesus, Satan knows where to get you. What did Jesus say? Jesus told his disciples, be careful because the enemy is like a roaring lion trying to deceive people. Right? So we must be aware of what the enemy's tactics are, the people from who are not saved. And in our lives, right? close every door, close every place where you feel the enemy is working. you got to close it. Holy Spirit is not going to close it. you got to take the effort to close it. Right? And so these are spirits of disobedience that are working. Just like how the Holy, there is the Holy Spirit and he has gifts. There are spirits of evil, evil spirits that are working. But remember, you are stronger than them. Your power, your, the Holy Spirit inside you is greater than he that is in the world. You understand? Yes? Do you believe that? Yes? Okay. Three. Another way of hindering the proclamation of the gospel. The devil works to hinder the proclamation of the gospel. Why? Because he knows that the gospel is able to save lives. Right? So, for example, you're, you, know, you want to become a pastor. Example, right? Or you want to be an evangelist. You want to be a prophet. You want to start your own ministry. The devil will be after you. And he will try to stop you in every way. Every way. And personally, I've seen that. He will try the smallest way to stop you. Because he doesn't want you to proclaim the gospel to anybody. Why? Because he knows the power of the gospel. He knows that if their hearts are open to the gospel, they will receive it. Right? I was sharing with the uh, second years. Uh, in the class, you know, we were talking about the pastoral calling, and I was sharing, you know, uh, many years ago when I decided to join Bible college, I was working in the IT sector. Moved out, I said, okay, I want to join uh, Bible college, and I wanted to do something for God. Right? Now, I didn't join Bible college just to waste my time. I, I, I was, I said, God, these two years, I want to see my life changed. So I was excited, just like all of us. Right? I hope you're excited with Bible College. <laughs> You've got to be passionate about it. Right? So when I joined, I was excited. I was 23 years old. And uh, I joined the worship team at, at APC. And uh, you know, I remember this. I would spend a lot of time reading the Word and you know, just, just immersing myself in the Word. I wouldn't talk to people, just always on the Word. And, Spending time in prayer, but I remember this one thing, you know, every time the phone will ring, I'll get a message, so I'll stop praying and check my phone. After the prayer, I would feel so bad. I'd say, God, I, something's wrong inside. I came here, but uh, something's wrong. I need to do something more. And over time, I, 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 I kept realizing that. 
I'm spending a lot of time doing other things rather than spending time in God's presence. And I'm doing all other things very well, leading worship, setting the song list. It's important. But I'm not spending time in your presence. I mean, that one hour is not enough, God. So there was this sense of urgency. I said, God, you do something. And I felt one day that I have to depart from this phone. So I took the phone, I switched it off, and I kept it away. But then, after a few days while praying, I'm thinking of who's going to call me. They're going. It's going to say it's switched off. Who's going to message? What if uh, there's a need in the worship team? What if there is my, my parents try to call? What if my uncle is trying to call? All these thoughts started coming. I thought to myself, God, it's not helping me. Right? I knew that this is something the devil is stopping me from. Now, what is this? It's a phone. Nothing, no big deception, nothing. It's a phone. What did I do? I went to the toilet, I put the phone in, and I flushed it. Two years, no phone. It's like, God, this is for you. Two years for you. I don't need a phone. I need you more than anything. My friends got so upset. You should have given me the phone. I said, no. Flushed in the toilet. I said, God, you got to work in me that I can display God's power. I'm not wasting my time here. Right? So, proclamation of the gospel is important, but the devil is hindering us. He will. Now, all of you are laughing. I think it's through. The... <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I think through the phones. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really talk about all of that. But this is something I did personally. But I'm not saying you do the same thing. What I'm saying is cut off things that are stopping you from proclaiming the gospel. Who has to do it? You have to do it. You have to do it. Okay. The devil works to hinder the proclamation of the gospel. One, through any means. Two, by infiltrating into the local church. Now, the enemy can you know, cause problems within the church. And in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, we see the churches that God is, to, you know, Jesus is talking to them. The church in Smyrna, there's a presence of group, uh, presence of a group of people that belongs to Satan and devil is going to cause some of them to be put in prison. So in the church of Smyrna, now let me give you a background. These were real churches that were there during that time, right? When when Jesus was speaking through Revelation through uh, to Apostle John, these are real churches, not not simply some church, real churches, right? There's a presence of the devil in the church, and what is happening there in the church of Smyrna, causing some to be put in prison. What is prison? Not a physical prison, but their lives are being put into a prison, right? What is all of us sometimes can be in a prison. Okay, I'm, I'm here I'm doing the same thing. I'm living in a prison of sin, right? There was this one friend of mine. He's a powerful, uh, powerful minister of God, right? Very powerful. I, I like the way he ministers. He was very, very good in preaching the gospel. Very powerful. Wherever he goes, there were miracles. One day he said, I want to talk to you. And I met him. I was shocked. To hear something. You know what he said? He said, I'm in ministry for 10 years now. For the past eight years, I've been addicted to pornography. Eight years. I said, 10 years you're in ministry. Yeah, first two years was good. After that third year, things changed. So here, watching pornography, asking for forgiveness, coming, preaching the gospel, but still God is doing wonders. Why? Because God is true to his word. But there came a time when you can't go on. Right? You can't keep fooling. You can fool one person at one time. Five people, ten people. But you can't fool everyone all the time. Right? It came out in the open that he was in this prison. And I told him, I told him, you ask God for forgiveness. God can restore you. He's a God who restores. It's the devil who wants you to stop this ministry that you're doing because you're doing a great work. Right? 
but it came out in the open. Things didn't go the way he wanted it to. But you see, God, the enemy can put us into these prisons, but he also puts unbelievers in these prisons. Right? So what does Jesus say? To set the blind eyes, to open prison doors. That's what we are called for. We go, we pray for people, we open the doors of prison that they are in. Give them an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Then we got the church at Pergamos, place where Satan's throne is and Satan dwells. The doctrine of Balaam infiltrating the church. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament, Balaam, there was a there was a prophet named Balaam, and he was involved in idol worship, right? And so he's saying the doctrine of Balaam, that doctrine of idol worship, is coming into the church infiltrating the church right and the church in Thyatira false prophetess Jezebel is at work now it doesn't mean Jezebel the prophet the false prophet was there the spirit of Jezebel was working what, what was Jezebel as a woman she was a woman of pride arrogance she hated the God of Israel right and 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 we see that that spirit is working in the church at Thyatira. Finally, the church in Philadelphia, a presence of a group of, that belongs to Satan, will cause them to bow before the church. Can you picture that? In the church, there is a group of people who are involved in, you know, in the works of Satan. He will cause them to bow down. So believers bowing down to the things of Satan, which simply means believers falling into the traps of the devil right now we've seen how the enemy can work but what is the church's responsibility everyone say i am the church thank you i am the church say that the church is not a building right we know that right i am the church so what is my responsibility let's look at that the church is to be light to the Gentiles, opening prisons doors and bringing those in darkness out of the prison house. What is my, what is my responsibility? To be a light to the Gentiles. I love this uh, in the book of Isaiah. Pull up that Isaiah 60. Now, 60. In Isaiah 60, now let me give you this background, right? The Babylonians have come. They, the Jews are living in a time of uh, uh, the Babylonians have come. They've, they've uh, a time of uh, a siege during that time, and the Babylonians are controlling the Jews at that time right now this is a prophetic word to Isaiah what is God telling Isaiah arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you there is darkness that covers the earth and thick darkness over the people but the Lord will arise upon you right and his glory appears over you nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So the Jews are living in captivity. They're living in darkness. Of course, this is uh, prophetic to even the Lord Jesus. But what does it say there? Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord will arise upon each one of us. The nations will see the light and glorify God. Right? The church has kingdom authority and spiritual weapons to overthrow what the devil is doing so you and i have kingdom authority and spiritual weapons to overthrow what the devil is using doing let's read a couple of verses there matthew chapter 12 28 and 29 Matthew 8, 
12, sorry, 28 and 29, and somebody else can open Luke chapter 11, 21 and 22. You see, see what uh, Jesus is doing there? This is Matthew 12, 28 and 29, right? 12. How can he... How can a person overpower a strong man unless he binds him and then enters the house? So Jesus is just using that example of binding, right? When, for example, you know, the devil is working, right? What if, or forget, let's take another example. What if I take a person and I tie up his hands and legs and make him stand in the corner there? Can he move? No. He's tied up and his hands and legs, he's fully tied up. He cannot move. He cannot do anything. He's there, but he's powerless. Right? Now, that's what Jesus is saying. When you, you and I know that the devil is there, but he's bound. We're binding the work of the devil. Right? You say, devil, you don't have any authority. Right? We're binding your work. We're binding the uh, the the thoughts that you're bringing over people's minds. We're binding your the spirit of sickness or diseases that you're bringing over people, binding it. Right? That means what you're saying, you're there, but that your work is powerless. You can't do anything. Right? And then how do we overcome? Luke chapter 11, 21 and 22. Right. So to bind and to overcome or to subdue means the same thing. Let's close with this. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Now, this is powerful because Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. This is his last letter. And he's giving them or advising and exhorting the congregation on how to live. Here's what he says. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Read. I love this verse. Such a powerful verse. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They pull down strongholds. Can you think of that? Right? You and I have weapons. Ephesians 6, he talks about the full armor of God. Right? You and I have weapons. But those weapons that we have, they're not carnal, which means they're not fleshly, but they're mighty in God. They pull down strongholds they demolish arguments and reasonings right using our spiritual weapons we can destroy the blindness that satan creates so that people can receive the light of the gospel you and i are to use the weapons that we have imagine we have a person in the army right he's put on the full armor of god sorry he's put on his natural armor but he's sitting there and he's getting scared. Oh, man, I don't want to go into the battlefield. I have everything. I have the sword. I have the shield. I have the spear. I have the guards. I have the helmet. I have everything. But he's sitting in the tents and looking and saying, oh, I don't want to go into the battlefield. Is he worthy to be an, uh, a soldier? He's not. Because he, he has everything. His responsibility is to go into the battlefield and fight. Now, God has given us the armor. 
he has given us weapons for our warfare but we cannot sit back and say let others fight and i will watch no he's saying the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they're mighty in god we must use those weapons and be ready to go into the battlefield amen and so the battlefield is doesn't mean a literally battlefield we know the world is our battlefield wherever we are there may be souls bound in prison if we get an opportunity remember put on the armor of god and use your spiritual weapons right so we'll stop here we'll continue from uh, bringing spiritual transformation from next week let's just quickly close in prayer father we want to thank you for your word we want to thank you for teaching us and empowering us lord we pray that we will continue to lord walk in the spirit to lead with the anointing of the holy spirit upon our lives give us opportunities to demonstrate the power of your holy spirit in our lives we are grateful for what you are doing in our lives oh god we pray lord for each of our, each and every one of us students especially that you would bless them bless them in their studies and uh, lord prepare them for the things ahead in their lives oh god we thank you we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a great week.